Hetty pulled his suitcase from the back of the SUV, and as they approached the apartment, Dennis walked out and shook Eddie's hand. Hello, Eddie. It's been too long. Nice to see you. Dennis directed Eddie to the guest room, and April started putting food out on the table. During dinner, April made sure the conversation was kept light, especially with Bobby listening attentively to everything. She turned to Eddie. I almost forgot. I ran into an old friend of yours a few days ago. You did? Who's that? Joel Radke. Eddie looked surprised. Joel? How's he doing? He seems to be doing just fine. He graduated from the University of Wisconsin and took a job in finance. He's moved to Chicago. He's got an office down on Wabash Avenue. I told him you were coming, and he said he'd love to see you while you're here. Eddie frowned. Um, oh, did he? I don't know. Maybe I... April cut him short. Now, Eddie, Mother wanted you to come stay with us so you could get out of your rut. I think it would be nice to see Joel and catch up with him. He said he could come over around 2 o'clock tomorrow. I told him that would be fine. Oh, it won't take him very long to catch up with me. One sentence will just about cover it. I still live at home with my mother. Don't be foolish. Joel doesn't care about that. You guys were close in junior high. I think it's nice that he wants to see you again. Eddie didn't reply. He glanced over at Dennis and noticed that he didn't seem to be paying any attention to the conversation. Dennis had his head down. It dawned on Eddie that Dennis hadn't spoken at all during the meal. April decided it would be best to change the subject. She asked a few questions about her mother and inquired about some of the neighbors. After dinner, Dennis said he was tired. He got up from the table and disappeared into the bedroom. Bobby asked Eddie to play some of his video games with him. After picking up the dishes, April grabbed a book and sat next to the guys as they worked their controllers and bantered back and forth. At nine o'clock, she made Bobby go to bed. She grabbed two beers from the fridge and handed one to Eddie. What do you think of Dennis? Eddie took a sip and thought for a while. Like you said in the car, he seems like a different person. Something's bothering him. Is he getting any help from the VA? Yes, he signed up for counseling after I got on his case. But I don't see anything changing. He's really got me worried. She took a sip from her drink. Don't say anything to Mom. She's got enough to worry about. Immediately, she regretted what she had said. Eddie looked over at her and smiled. You got that right. I'm sorry, Eddie. It's just that with Dennis coming back. Don't worry. We both know what the situation is. Look, maybe tomorrow I can talk to him. We were close, you know, before he we went overseas. I'd like that. He needs to be around someone who knew what he was like before. They talked for two more hours, and then April glanced at the clock. Oh, it's ten after eleven. I need to get to bed. I have to catch the L tomorrow morning at seven. She got up, walked over, and gave him a hug. I'm glad you're here. Is there anything you need in your bedroom? An extra blanket? No, no, I'm okay. You still working down in the loop? April sighed, yes. Eddie shook his head. I don't know how you do it. All those people. Joe Casperson slammed the receiver down and let out a string of obscenities. That bitch won't let me talk to the old guy. His wife looked over at him. You keep up that harassment, you'll find yourself right back in jail. All she's got to do is call the cops. They'd love to haul your ass back there. I can't believe you didn't get arrested when they run you off his place last week. They could have picked you up for trespassing. You should thank your lucky stars old Wilfred didn't call the cops on you. You should know how probation works by now. Joe sneered at her. Just listen to yourself. Tony's gone because of that asshole. I know, Joe, and there's nothing you can do to change things. But we made a promise to your sister. We promised we'd watch out for him. Madge wiped a tear from her eye. She went so fast. Joe walked to the refrigerator and pulled out a beer. And Tony sat right here at this table and told us how pissed off he was that old man Fredericks kept sending them out no matter what the weather. He took a swig. I swear, he knew this was going to happen. He kept bitching about how that boat was falling apart. 
How Wilfred never put no money into it. He ran his fingers through his hair. I should have gone over there and checked it out. I, I can't believe he's gone. And them poor other guys, needlessly. Just so Fredericks could sell more fish. Madge pulled a cigarette out of his pack and lit it. Nobody should have gone out that day. I know Svensson pulled out all their boats. Nobody else was out there but Fredericks. Somebody should sue him and sue him good. Joe gave her a weak smile. Maybe that's why he won't take my call. He thinks we're going to sue his ass. Why are you calling him anyway? To tell him what I think of him. Tell him everybody knows what he done. His wife looked at him through a cloud of blue smoke. You don't think he knows? His boat's gone. He's out of business. He knows, but he don't care. I got to make this right for Tony. She frowned. How are you going to do that? Tony's dead. I don't know, but I got to do something. Chapter 3 It was apparent that the meeting didn't go well. Brad Feldman's secretary, Roxanne Deloria, watched as he stormed past her desk, walked into his office and slammed the door. The door hit with such force that the picture of him with the studio head Irving Smaltzman came crashing down onto the floor right next to her. Roxanne had worked for Brad for three years. Brad was 46 years old when she met him during their interview. She found him very attractive and outgoing. He stood about six feet tall with black hair that was graying at the temples. Compared to other television producers she had worked for, she found that he was quite genuine, not so full of himself. She walked over, gently picked up the larger pieces of glass from the broken picture frame, and tossed them into her wastebasket. She knew that under the circumstances, it would be best to let him cool off by himself for at least half an hour. Thirty-five minutes later, his door swung open. Bren walked over and sat down next to her. She waited for him to talk first. That damn Irving wants to cancel a show. Says he's getting stale. She thought about it a moment. Well, it's been on for four years. That's a long time for a cable channel. It's been on for four years because people love it. Our ratings have been going up, up, up. She knew the ratings had started to decline this last season, but she didn't say anything because she knew Brad knew it too. So it's over, she asked. Just about. He said if we could freshen it up and reduce the production costs, he'd consider another season. That's good. Do you have anything in mind? I do. I was thinking about what the best way was to cut costs. The travel. You got it. Sending our crews all over the country is costing us a fortune. We feature four different haunted houses per episode. That's where the money goes. What if we found one great place and filmed the whole season there? Roxanne smiled. I love it. That would give the show a whole new slant and Irving would be thrilled. He's always sending me nasty emails about hotel and meal expenses. Great idea. We'll have to find a new place and shoot a pilot. We could do it in about 10 days. Then show Irving and see what he thinks. Do you have any place in mind? Roxanne asked. People send me emails just about every day with suggestions. We've got to come up with a place. Can you take a look at some of them and grab the best 20 for me to review? Roxanne turned to her computer. Sure, when do you want them? Let's meet tomorrow, around 11 o'clock. Would that give you enough time? I think so. Brad stood up. Good, I'm headed over to the frolic room. I need a drink. She looked surprised. The frolic room? On Hollywood Boulevard? Yes. Did you know that was the last place? The Black Dahlia was seen alive, he interrupted. Yes, I do know that. Hey, if that place was good enough for Elizabeth Short, it's good enough for me. Don't end up like her, dead and mutilated a block away. We've got enough legends around here. We don't need another one. The next morning, Brad's head felt like it was twice its size. Even the smell of coffee, a fragrance he normally loved, was enough to almost trigger an episode of the dry heaves. He stood in the shower for 20 minutes and let steaming hot water pour over him. He thought this part of his life was behind him. After all, he'd been married seven years and had two kids. It had been quite a shock when they moved out. That first night when he came home to an empty house, he thought they'd been robbed. 
Then he found the note. He knew things had not been going great for the last year, but he blamed that on his hectic travel schedule. He remembered how his wife had given him those ultimatums. First, he had never thought they were actually ultimatums. And secondly, there was really nothing he could do about it. The job dictated that he travel every week. She didn't seem to mind the money he was pulling in. Fred stumbled out of the shower, dried off, and hurriedly got dressed. When he walked into the office, Roxanne looked up and did a double take. Oh, so it's Mr. Black Dahlia. Looks like someone did a number on you. He did, the bartender. He should have cut me way off before he did. Tell me you didn't drive home from there, Roxanne said with a look of concern. No, they called a cab. That's how I got here today. You're going to have to drive me over there at lunch so I can pick up my car. Oh, great. Maybe we can have a triple martini lunch like they do in the Mad Men. Brad rolled his eyes. Just the thought of more alcohol was enough to make him sick. Stop. I'm going into my office. Wake me up when you finish with that list. At 11.15, Roxanne knocked softly on his door and pushed it open. He was sleeping with his head on the desk. She walked over, pulled out a chair, and coughed discreetly. He rolled open one eye and slowly sat up. I know it's none of my business, she said, but you really need to get back with your wife. This new single life is going to put you into an early grave. He sat up and slowly massaged his temples. Tell me about it. It's not that I haven't been trying. Most of the time, she won't even take my calls. Keep trying. You need to get back to a stable life. She was about to say, you're getting too old for this, but changed her mind. He headed toward the door. I need to wash my face. I'll be right back. When Brad returned, he looked a little more awake. Before we look at the houses, I want you to write down this name. She flipped open her notebook. Okay. Dr. Hilton. Who's he? Roxanne asked. He's not a he. He's a she. Oh, sorry. Who's she? Someone I completely forgot about. But last night at the bar, I was talking with some of my friends about how we could change the show, and one of them started talking about her. She was all the rage in, I'm not sure, the late 60s, the mid-70s, I think. When he mentioned her name, I sort of remembered her. That was before my time, but I've seen her on reruns of some of those old talk shows. She was quite the character. She taught parapsychology at Duke for a while. See if you can find her, Roxanne thought for a moment. If she was popular in the 60s, she's probably dead by now. Oh, I hope not. Just see if you can find her. What's her first name? Brad thought for a moment. Claudia? Carol? I don't remember. Something like that. Everyone called her Dr. Hilton. He turned to the folder she had placed on his desk. Okay, what have you got? I went over everything you sent me. The folder is really thick. I reread all of the possibilities and pulled the top ten. I thought we'd start with those. If you don't like any of them, I've got a hundred more we can look at. I can't believe there's so many haunted houses out there. Oh, I bet 90% of them are just people trying to make a buck. Probably nothing ever happened in most of them. Do you have them in order from the best to the worst? I do. Brad smiled. I know how you work. Okay, let's start with number 10 and work our way up. An hour later, they were both standing up at Brad's desk, surrounded by papers. Looks like we're down to two. Which one do you like the best? Roxanne pointed to a paper and said, I like this one. He smiled and looked over at her. Why? How can you not like it? It's in New Orleans. The place looks very southern gothic. I like the moss hanging from the trees and the old wrought iron on the balconies. I don't know. It just looks haunted to me. Brad nodded. I agree with everything you said. It looks perfect, but one thing bothers me. What's that? New Orleans has been done to death. It's what people expect. They've seen countless shows about hauntings in New Orleans. It's old. Remember? Irving said he wanted something fresh. Okay, I can't argue with that. She picked up the last paper. To tell you the truth, I don't even know where this house is. He glanced over the page. It's in Michigan. Let's look it up, she said, sitting down at his computer. Hmm, are you sure it's in Michigan? 
Looks like it should be part of Wisconsin. Let's look at the satellite view. Roxanne bent down and looked at the computer screen. Are you kidding? Looks like there's a bunch of nothing there. Look at all those trees. There's nothing but woods. She turned to him. I don't know. Looks kind of remote, doesn't it? Brad looked excited. Yes, it's different. It looks wild and isolated, just like Mrs. Halstead's email said. But think about it. An old lady who hung herself? She says she sees her hanging from the staircase sometimes late at night. Those noises they hear and the things moving from place to place. And don't forget about those two kids that drowned, Roxanne added. Oh yeah, sounds pretty interesting. Send her an email. Let's see what happens.